Hello and thanks for tuning in to hear our conversation today with Owen Coyle. Former Claybank for Falkirk Avery and the United Striker, my name is Eric McAuley and I'm the General Manager of World Strike Sports Division. Excited to welcome Owen today to share his experience, insights and reflections with our global community. Going to go off a little script here. Um, Owen and I first met back in the early to mid 80s, um, but his journey has, has taken him on a, a long and fantastic career. Growing up in the Corbels area of Glasgow, scored over 100 goals for Dumbarton Clydebank in the before I moved down to England. Um, fantastic couple of years down at Bolton, and then I return up to Scotland with some top Premier League clubs. Um, Owen's big break came at St Johnston, where two years of success in Perth led to a move to Burnley English Championship. May 2009, Owen led them back to the top level um, for the first time in, in 33 years, following spells at Bolton, Wigan, Blackburn, Ross County, and then on to Houston Dynamo. Owen's currently the head coach of Chennai in, in the Indian Super League. Owen, huge thanks for joining us today and great to see you. How are you doing? I'm just glad I've got enough time for questions after all that. I know, and that was quite a script, <laughs> wasn't it? Um, but I, I think that's your career. You know, that just sums up where you've been in the amount of club. That's, that's more long-winded than any we've done, Owen. I didn't realise there's so many clubs, but there you go. You it's, uh, well, it's I'm buzzing awesome. and, and great to see you're doing so well. And, and obviously, the, the success in India, I've been keeping an eye on it. And what a brilliant, you know, end to your season there, finishing up so well with your boy there too. But let's take us back, Owen, and just to get it started here. I first met you, it's probably around 1983, I was in training for six months at Dumbarton at the old Boghead Stadium. And uh, you and I were talking offline before we get started there. And what, a, what a great ground and an experience that must have been for you, Owen. Um, you know, especially at that club, just getting yourself buried in, playing with your two older brothers, Tom and Joe. Um, and I also remember playing a reserve game with you. I mentioned that before we come online. We, we, we played St. Mun one particular night. Uh, I think you were playing left midfield and scoring a penalty. We won on nothing, but... Just take it back to your time at Dumbarton, and I'm sure you think back fondly to those times. I do. It was, it was very special, and, and fair, I was very lucky in many respects because I think I mentioned that I had the opportunity to sign for Dundee United, who were one of the top four clubs in Scotland at the time, the age of 13. It was called a schoolboy for they gave you a five or a week, and you were, you, were, you, were, you were their player. But my father, obviously, was Irish from, from Dundee Dolls, yeah. friends with. Sean Fallon, who was Jock Steen's assistant when Celtic were the first British club to win the European Cup. And Sean was director, and they said to my dad, listen, young Owen's better served with his two older brothers because Joe and Tommy were signed in the band, but a much smaller club. They said, but they can keep an eye on him. So with that in mind, my dad decided, you know, as we chatted, that's where you should go. To be honest, it was the best thing that ever happened, Eric, because at 16, when they make the decisions, I was really small, I was like five foot three, five foot four, and pencil thin, really slim. Even when I played my old career, I mean, I played it. 64 kilos, you know, in the, yeah. in the Premier League in England. I was always very slim, but I was really short. But at Dumbarton, because there was no pressure, it wasn't a big club, they just allowed me to pot away, play the reserves. Until such time, just when I, just over 18, uh, I grew to about 5, 11 and a half, and they put me straight in the first team. Now, had I been at Dundee United at 16, I would probably be released because I was so small. And the great thing, and this is something to do with, I always say to coaches, you know, don't be too quick to judge. You know, the small ones don't think, oh, I need to be all those big physical players. Sometimes they all grow at different times. And they, unfortunately, I did. Went straight to the first team and, and obviously then made a, made a decent career. So really lucky in that respect. It was a brilliant club with fantastic young players. I mean, the button had a multitude of players and only brilliant, brilliant careers. And I think, you know, looking back, Owen, when I, I remember you and I talked about this too, is, is I remember, you know, again, you were small, you were, you were thin, you were light. But I, I distinctly remember you playing as a sweeper. For, for quite a period of time back then, yeah. when you were 16 and 17. But I also remember the players that you played around. You'll probably remember big Donald McNeil, you know, who was yeah. experienced, big old school centre half. And, you know, I remember that Mark Clocker, he was around at that time. And I'm sure you think back to probably that was a key part of your journey as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think I was really lucky because out with the young talent we had with fantastic senior, senior pros, and they looked out for the young ones. They wanted to help them. I mean, when I came into the first team, John Burke, who played the Dundee United, Kilmarnock, six foot four. And as a young striker, it was brilliant because it was like, latterly, I actually played with Niall Quinn with the Republic under 21s. But it was a similar thing. As long as you made the runs, they were just nodding things down. And for a striker, that was brilliant. So the learning curve in these really good professionals, because they were part-time, they also had their, their, their day jobs, some of them, you know, and all different things. 
uh, but really, really good people. And they always, I think, do a pride in, in helping the young ones on their journey. So I was really fortunate to be a wonderful club with, with some great people that you mentioned there. And, and, and Davey Wilson was the manager at that time. Obviously, he was a, a Ranger legend. He was a total icon. I actually remember him joining in training quite a bit on. And, but I'm sure that, you know, that was probably one of your initial, you know, mentors, leaders, managers, as you were coming through as a young kid. Do you remember, you know, his influence on you as well as the senior players? Yeah, I do I always remember him saying, you know, if you were a bit taller, you'd be right in my first team. This was when I was 16 and a half, and obviously, you know, I had to be patient for a couple of years. But it was, it was actually Davey's idea to, to play me at sweeper. Uh, the Barton had part-time team, but got to the Premier League, which was an incredible achievement. But he said, if you play at sweeper, it'll toughen you up playing against these big physical. And I, I mentioned what we're playing on the one night, Frank McDougall, who was like a Scotland centre forward, and Frank McDougall could throw the biggest centre halves in the country at the road, never mind a wee skinny guy for the Gorbals. So yeah. he, was, he, was, he was very kind to me, I've got to say, on the night. But uh, it was a great learning curve. And that's the things that actually stand, they stand in good stead for your career. You know, the stuff you learn playing against those, those grown men. And then, uh, no, it was brilliant. And David Wilson, obviously, it was his idea to do that. So, uh, there was, a, there was a method in his madness. Brilliant. And, and as we talk through your journey, Owen, you know, I, obviously you go through your journey, you know, as a player, but I distinctly remember your period at Airdrie. You know, I, I, I remember one crazy period. I think you scored like four or five hat tricks in a row. It was like four or five weeks in a row. I remember because it was the talk of Scotland at the time, you know, and it was on every radio show and they were waiting for the next hat trick. And it was, I'm maybe saying four or five in a row, but it felt like that at the time. And, now, distinctly remember that team and, and the culture of that team. And, and you constantly punched way above your weight. Yeah. You know, do, do you recall, what do you recall for that team and what made it so successful and what get the best out of you at that time, Owen? No, well, I mean, I think it was. I mean, again, it always comes back, I think, to, to the people you're working with and, and the standards that get set and, and what you want for your club and what, you, you know, what you're prepared to accept. And, uh, and I came into a good team. You're right, I mean, I, I had the best goal scoring form in, in my career. I'd actually score, I'd scored 17 goals in seven league games, four consecutive hat tricks. And the only reason, I'm going to say the only reason I stopped, but we had a big, if you remember, a big crazy goalkeeper, John Martin. John Martin. Yeah, John Martin actually injured me in training. I went to flick a ball in and he, he, he didn't, there was no malice. He just came to get the ball. And I did my medial ligament. It was the only injury I ever had in my career. And I played till I was nearly 40. But that was the best for, and you're right. I mean, it was obviously good. if somebody scored a hat trick every week, it's, it's, a, it's a big story. And uh, so, unfortunately, I had that, I had that injury. And uh, but the, when I came back fit, we got promoted in the, yeah. the Premier League. Alex McDonald uh, was the manager. We got promoted with Jimmy Bowen, and then Alex McDonald took over. And uh, and I loved Alex McDonald. It was what we had was was a work ethic as a team. It was second to none. We weren't, as you know, you've seen that team play, we weren't the most pleasing in the eye in terms of the football we played, but we all knew our jobs. Everybody knew our job. And we, nobody liked playing against us. I think Aberdeen came to play against Theo Snelders and these boys, and, and, and they labelled us the Beastie Boys. I mean, I was 63 kilos. Jimmy Boyle was 5 foot 6. Alan Lodge was 5 foot 7. It was a team of like misfits and midgets, but we all worked our socks off for each other. We had run through a brick wall for Alec McDonald. And the success we had, I mean, we finished seventh in the league in the 12th team Premier League. We went to the Scottish Cup final against Glasgow Rangers, narrowly lost 2-1. We were robbed in the semi-final league club uh, with Davy Simon as a referee when I hit Jimmy Sanderson's shoulder and he gave a penalty against us. And then from the Scottish Cup, we qualified to play in Europe against Sparta Prague. So it was incredible, but the work ethic and the desire of that team, it was second to none. Those, those boys would have done anything for their teammates. And I think to those players, Owen, you, you just nailed it there. I think to those players, I distinctly remember the players from that team. There was Evan Balfour, Paul Jack, Sandy Stewart, um, Chris Honor, yourself. And, and it wasn't household names. You know, it wasn't names that, that, that were the talk of the town at the time. But, and then you obviously had Alex McDonald and one of my favourite guys. You, you'll remember, I love John McVeigh. John McVeigh. Listen, love John. But I love John. And, and I was with John at Falkirk. And he's still one of my favourite people I've ever came across in life. And, and when I look at Alec McDonald and John McVeigh, what they must have instilled in that team was, was just took you to places that you probably shouldn't have been. No, absolutely. I mean, I think it's fair to say that uh, when you looked at other teams with fantastic individuals, but collectively, the sum of our parts, when you put them all together, it, it was incredible. And what they did, I mean, Alex and, and, and John McVeigh, and Don John McVeigh, John Binney was there as well, deserves enormous credit, but they asked you to play to your maximum. 
You know, just you've got to give, whatever your qualities were, bring those qualities, but bring them within the team. I'm laughing when you mention Evan Balfour, and this is a true story, and I'm sure Evan won't mind me sharing it. We were preparing for the Scottish Cup final against Rangers, and we're down at Troon training the day before the final. Now, Evan Balfour is a first pick in Alec McDonald's team every week. Oh, yeah. Got paid because Evan Balfour was the best in Scotland at getting the ball back. Mm-hmm. But after that, it wasn't his strength, if I'm honest, and he knows that. So Alex McDonald says, right, as soon as Evan recovers the ball, get one or two round about him, get the ball and go and play. So the day before the cup final, and we're playing, it was 8v8, we only had 16 and we're writing it, and Alex McDonald says, right, listen, now, if Evan gets the ball and he's allowed to pass it, it's a free kick to the other team. <laughs> <laughs> and Evan Balfour said, what? He says, I'm, he says Evan, Evan, your strength is winning getting the ball. Now remember, Evan's going to play in a cup final. He's wanting to show people that, he, that he's a good player. And I'm going to ask Evan, understand what you're good at. That's what's brought us to where we are. You win the ball. As soon as you win it, get people around about it and take it and go and play. Right? So Evan, was so much so Evan took in the ball. I think he blazed the ball right into the sea. It was, anyway, once he realised, Alex spoke to him and then away he went. But that's preparation for a cup final. And he's still playing. Your central midfielder, <laughs> if, you can, if you start past the ball, it's a free kick to the other team. Brilliant. But I think, you know, and, and obviously I've, I've met you and Sandy on, on various occasions, different places. That was probably your, your early days building that relationship with Sandy Stewart, which is taking you up literally to this day, Owen. You know, describe that kind of relationship and the journey. You know, it's funny, with David Moyes on earlier today, and I asked him a similar question about him and Jimmy Longston. You know, Jimmy's went everywhere with Moisey, yeah, and you know, I think Sandy's kind of done similar with you, and... and, and Describe that a little bit and what he's good at and how he compliments you. Well, that's a, uh, again, we, like, first and foremost, the two of us, we absolutely love football. We're very fortunate, very blessed that we've had their career in it. But we we travelled in together, we got on really well. We're different characters, as you know. I mean, Sandy yeah. likes a pint, he likes a pint, and what have yeah. you. Whereas I like an out, but I don't drink and everything else. And we have different, I would say different personalities, but it works really well. But the other thing is he's a terrific coach. And we were lucky because when we were players at Airdrie, at that time the SFA brought a really nice, good initiative for players anyway, that you could do your B licence on a Wednesday on your day off at Lesser Hartman. So we all went, you know, and certainly myself, Sandy, uh, Jimmy Boyer from Airdrie, and there was boys from all other clubs, remember Stephen Presley, the young player at Rangers, been there, Bobby Williamson, loads, loads of really talented players and, and very good coaches that were not to do very well. So by the age of 24, you already had your B licence. We did our A introductory in the summer, so by, the, by 24 coming up for 25, you were actually only one step away from being an A licensed coach. So we're really lucky and we would obviously similar ideas in the game. And, they, and then as it progressed, we were then, latterly, we were player coaches together at Airdrie Orients. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the final season before Airdrie Orients went bust. Then Sandy took over Airdrie United as, as player manager. Yeah. I went to Falkirk as, as, as player coach. And then me and Yogi took over as player managers. So when I then moved to St. Johnston in my own right as manager, I, in, in between, I'd actually went to Dundee United as player coach. And yeah. then I was on the bench and I said to Colin, to even call his manager, I said, listen, I love taking the reserve, which I did. Used to, they played on a Monday. I said, but I'm 37, 38 now. I said, I'm not going to be sitting on the bench when I'd been the top scorer in the championship the year before. I've still got a lot to offer. And he said, right, I'll let you go on loan and play somewhere on a Saturday. I said, brilliant. So I actually went on loan to Sandy when he was the manager and played for him at every United. We won the second division. I think we were whether it was 10 points by Morton, and I managed to score, whether it was 15 goals in the last 12 games, or something like that. But anyway, we won the league and got promoted. And, uh, and then I eventually moved to St. Johnston. Because I played at Airdrie United, I knew a lot of the players. I actually signed three of his best players for St. Johnston. Big like Martin Harvey, Alan McManus, Willie McClarn. So anyway, we were competing against each other in that, that championship that season. Uh, and unfortunately, actually, Sandy lost his job. Uh, which was a disgrace because how well he done but he did that's the nature of football and uh, but then Jim Weir who'd been my assistant Jim got the chance to be the controls manager in his own right and then uh, he wanted that so I encouraged him to, to do it that's what he wanted to do and that allowed me then to bring Sandy in as my assistant manager yeah. and we together ever since so you know I trust him implicitly but he's a fantastic coach and he's yeah. a different personality for me as you know I'm quite, not that he's not bubbly I am as well but that gives him a different relationship with the players so it works really well and I remember you telling me a story when you moved over to Houston Dynamo. Um, you'd obviously moved over to the States together and, and families were left behind. And you two became roommates 
you know, and you were you were living in a house together, and you and you were living out of each each other's back pockets. How was that experience for you? It was it was really great for me. I did you do? I, I bought a big house in uh, uh, Sienna Plantation, just in the outskirts of Houston. We loved we loved the time. Houston, great people, yeah. lovely club. The league's going to get better. I mean, yeah. the only reason to come back is my, my oldest daughter was getting married and having her first grandchild. Otherwise, I think we'd still be in America. We absolutely love it over there, and the yeah. people are so and they love the you know, I know they call it soccer, but they love the football. Yeah. It's getting bigger, it's getting better. And you see, you know, the grassroots with the kids, it can only go one way, it can only continue to be better as you know. But, so anyway, I said to Sandy, listen, there's no point you going by and I think, mate, the, the wives, the kids are going to come every six weeks by and forth, so you can have a room in. So he came into a room with me, which was fine. We got the pool put in and all that as well. And Sandy's a, he loves his son. So actually, when we left, he had the best tan in Texas when we left. <laughs> so he, he would be out at the pool and I, I, as much as I like the heat, I, I like it in the shade. So yeah. I would maybe be reading or looking at some footage or I'm doing different stuff. So it worked really well. And it, to be fair to him, he's a good cook, so that helped as well. <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. But how, how was that experience on? And I, I do remember talking to you at your game at DC United. And I, and I think in particular in that year, you, you, you quoted to me, you know, for away games, I think you flew like 64,000 miles or yeah. something. It was, you know, it was brand new for a guy who had spent majority is to your Scotland, England, um, you know, and you're going half an hour up the road for a derby, and then you're going for a, you know, an away game, it's three and a half days away, you know. It's, you're, it's a brilliant, yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant. that experience for you, Owen? No, I hear you, it was a brilliant point, and it was I open because even in, even in England, if, if we have a, like, if I'm leaving overnight to go to London, it's yeah. not only two and a half hours in the train, yeah. you know, so, and, and then sometimes if we have, if I have a derby, if, uh, Burnley are playing Blackburn, they're eight miles apart, and Bolton's playing, so, and even in Scotland, there, there isn't really any overnight trips, so you just travel really on the day. So, but going to, to the it was brilliant, uh, but what it was, and that's why a lot of the teams in the MLS have fantastic home records, because it does take a bit out of you, because where we were in, in Houston, when we obviously went to the East, we changed time zone, when we went to the West, we changed time zone, when we went up the middle, we were playing at altitude, yeah. so... Every, every away game was a different challenge for us. Yeah, so, yeah. But with that in mind, it, it was a brilliant, brilliant experience. Great clubs, enjoyed that. But there, there was a bit of, in terms of uh, eye-opening, the preparation had to be different. Sometimes you're leaving two and three days before before your game. Make sure you get the right training, make sure you're eating properly, uh, living in and out of hotels for players. So, uh, yeah, challenging but brilliant experience and, and loved every second of it. Fantastic. Well, take us back to your... You know, I think your early start in, in England, uh, I think it stands out to everybody. The early success you had with Burnley, and you know, it, it, you came in there and, and got them cranking very, very quickly. And, you know, give us a little insight to, to, to that time and that period and, and the culture that you built you built at Burnley, because that certainly wasn't expected of Burnley Football Club. No, to be fair, first and foremost, it was a brilliant opportunity. But it came in the back of... When we went into Falkirk, we'd, we'd win the championship in South Road. We were denied promotion because Falkirk Stadium, Brockford was getting demolished and we were going to build a new stadium. So they said that we didn't have our own stadium, denied promotion. Uh, and then obviously did fantastic at St Johnston, both myself and Sandy, to get the chance to go to Burnley. So yeah. I went to Burnley. Burnley were in the, in the bottom half of the championship. But some, yeah. some good players. I mean, Steve Cotter had brought some good players in and credit where credit's due. Uh, but the club had aspirations of trying to get to the Premier League. Uh, but there were some huge clubs in the championship. So what we did, the first season we took stock, we, we started really well uh, and got them playing some good football and different things. Then it came to the, the, the summer and what we'd done is we'd sold Andy Gray to, to Charlton yeah. for one and a half million plus half a million add-ons. We kept that one. That was in the, the January as soon as I came in. Uh, but what I did is I was able to go to Sunderland, which I did, and I got Andy Cole on loan for six months for the same salary that Andy Gray was earning. So we got a fantastic player in. Andy Gray was a good player. We don't take nothing away from him. But to bring Andy Cole, everything, I mean, it was, the training was, the passing, everything was better. It improved. Yeah. And all of a sudden, people say, no, these guys are serious. You know, they're not yeah. able to go and attack, you know, top. As much as he was 36, he still passed the ball like a Champions League player, still finished like a Champions League player. Maybe didn't have the same mobility for getting about the whole pitch. But from 40 yards to the goal, Andy Cole was still the same player. He was yeah. sensational. So yeah. that was a good bit of business. Uh, and, and that allowed then you know, the players to actually buy in into what we're doing. Then come the summer, we had big Kyle Lafferty. Yeah. Now, you know, Peter and Celtic were really keen on Kyle and been on for 
you know, number of times they, they liked them. Six foot four, kind of could run like the wind. He scored yeah. some terrific goals. He was outstanding for Northern Ireland. Fulham had been in for him the year before. So, and I said to Peter, I said, well, the valuation the club have is four million pounds. You know, if you pay the four million, then, then you... so Peter was always, oh well, I'll give you as he does. He's, he's terrific at wheeling the deal, and that's what Peter does. Yeah. You know, I'll get you. Know, I'll give you two and a half plus a couple of players here and there. I says, well, and to be fair, I like I like young Derek Ryder at the time who they brought from some Hibs. I, I liked him. I thought he was a good finisher, left side, and, and I thought he would do really well for a team like Burnley. And uh, he says, well, okay, yeah. So Ryder did two and a half million plus Ryder. And I said, well, I value Ryder than a half a million, Peter. No, no, he's worth one and a half, Peter. I mean, Peter. So we could never actually get to get to an agreement on those numbers. And then the season finished, and Peter rung me up, and he said, right, listen, I'll do. Uh, two two point seven five plus Ryardin. I said, Peter, my chairman won't accept four. If it's three million plus Ryardin plus half a million of add-ons, but you know they're guaranteed add-ons, you know yeah. that for, for appearances, you know, not in, yeah. you know, not one in a Champions League or something, but you know you're getting those add-ons, then I might be able to sell it to, to the chairman. He says, No, no, we can't go to that. I says, that's fine. So I put the phone down. Ten minutes later, I think it was Campbell Ogilvy at Ryan from Glasgow Rangers, and he says, Oh, and you know, Kyle Lafferty. I said, well, Campbell, I have to tell you, obviously, Celtic are keen on Kyle and everything else, and they've made an offer. He says, well, what, what's it going to take? I says, it's going to take £4 million. He says, yeah. well, that's a lot of money. I says, I know, but he's a talented quality player. That's what it will be. And he says, right, let me come back. So, about 15 minutes later, Campbell opened around back. He says, right, the club will do £3.5 million, yeah. uh, and half a million of add-ons. I said, well, the add-ons need to be guaranteed, like, for playing 20 games, 40 games, 50 games. Then you know within a season, you, you're yeah. getting that half a million. He says, right, I think we can do that. So uh, I think, okay, so I wrote my chairman. I said to the chairman, chairman, we've got you know, the four million you want for Kyle. It's three and a half down plus half a million, but you have the half a million within your know, season in a bit because they'll play all the games. So the chairman says, right, so we used the four million from Kyle, the one and a half and degree, five and a half million. And Burnley, to be fair, the, the directors and, 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 the, and Barry Kilby, the chairman, all the directors, they'd kind of prop the club up with, with giving loans to keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. So half of the money was used to pay back some of the loans and help with the cash flow with the club. And the other half of the money I, I was allowed to go and spend to try and build a team to be competitive. So I went to Dundee, I got big Kevin McDonald for £200,000. I went to Man United, I got uh, Chris Eagles from Sir Alex at Man United for half a million. Uh, we got young Martin Patterson, who's now working at Miami uh, yeah. in the USL. He's assistant manager at T- Tampa Bay last year with big Neil Collins, but he's That's in Miami. Right. So we paddled, we paid a million pounds for him. We scored 26 goals that season. He gets promoted. Uh, we, uh, I'm trying to think the other bits and pieces we did. We ended up getting big Stevie Thompson, big Tom on a free from Cardiff. Yeah. Honestly, pound, I always say, I'm pound for pound, you're the best signing I ever made. It yeah, cost me nothing. No, it's sensational for us. Because, so what we did, in, in answer to your question, we used the money up to bring players that kind of fitted into your dynamic, what we were doing. And that season, yeah, we, you know, people talk about fitness players, and that's why, and I always say to coaches, the pre-season is so important yeah. because it allows you to implement your ideas, but also allows you to get your players supremely fit, not for the first month of the season, but yeah. for the duration of the season. Yeah. That team at Burnley, that, uh, that Burnley team we had, played 61 games that season because we had fantastic cup runs. If you remember, we went to the semi-final against Tottenham in the League Cup, yeah. over two legs. We lost 4-1 at White Hart Lane, one left up at half-time. Lost 4 1. We came back to Turf Moor. We beat them 3 0. Now, in any, co- any other competition in the world, you're through and away goals. Away goals. In the Big Cup, away goals don't count until after extra time. Right. And Pavlochenko scored 90 seconds before the. Uh, anyway, so the, my point is they were supremely fit. 61 games. We used the fewest amount of players in the Championship. And actually, in the January, we were actually financially embargoed because I mentioned about the, the, the directors propping up the club. Mm-hmm. Now, Brendan Flood, who was instrumental in bringing me to Burnley, Brendan was, I think he put about £7 million from his company, Modus, in to keep the club going. So, had he not done that, had we not got promoted, God knows what would happen, but we did. It all came together because, and I always say this, everybody needs to be singing from the same hymn page at a club. Yeah. Everybody needs to be in this. Because if you're not, and there's, you know, it's not a good dynamic, but if yeah. you have everybody on board and everybody buying into what we're doing, you will always have a chance of success. And I think that was that was the obvious part for that Burnley team, Owen, and how you led it. And, you know, they punched above their weight. And there was so much, probably more talented squads in the championship. And and I think back to that wee guy for the Garbles, you know, and, and you taking Burnley on this run. I, you know, I, I think probably the, the question here is, 
you know, what, what's been your strongest traits of how you've led through that journey? And I remember that time, obviously, you were, you know, getting the Celtic job, you were quoted for the Arsenal job, you were, you know, is what do you think has been your strengths and your traits that's kind of kept you at the top and giving you success? And, and I, I certainly look at you and I look at you compliment with Sandy and, you know, it's, it, just kind of what, what, what do you think's kept you at that, you know, give you that success? Well, I think, you know, uh, the one thing we all crave, because sometimes we've not had it, but everybody loves a little bit of luck as well. But that being said, I think we've got a good, I think we've always had a good eye for players. We love working with young players to grow and develop them. Uh, because I think that's first, before you're a head coach or manager, first of all, you're a coach. And that, I think that job is to improve people and help people. And uh, so we've always been of the, but the other thing we've always tried to, to build is to make sure that that football club or, you know, whatever, that, it should be tight knit. It should be an extension of family. You should yeah. always feel that you're a part of it. And the other, and I think that's part of it to make sure everybody's inclusive. Yeah. And I think that I probably spend more time with the players that are not playing than yeah. the players that are playing. Because yeah. the ones that are playing are all happy. They're playing anyway. It's yeah. the other ones you've got to manage. You know, the, the disappointment they're not playing and still making sure that they know they've still have a chance. And I always think that group we had at Burnley that they all on a Monday morning they all believed. I've got a chance of playing this Saturday because we're inclusive, you know, and you don't, you know, you always make sure that everybody feel part of what you're doing. And, yeah. uh, and we'll get that one again with the, the love of the game. And we like to think we know a lot about it, but the passion, the enthusiasm we have for it, you're hoping that that rubs off on people and it takes everybody on that journey. And, and you know, one thing you just said there that sticks out, and I've always thought that is, is just your love and passion for the game, you know, and, and that rubs off on everybody else around you in that environment, in that circle, you know, and, and that's always been evident from that 16-year-old sweeper that played at the button. That was always your personality. I remember you were always a, a phenomenal communicator. You know, is is that was something that, that always kind of stood out about you. You just communicated very, very well. And, and I think that certainly kept you going through all those years. I think the question from this piece, Owen, is, you know, as you look back on your journey of all those, you know, fantastic teams and, and the journey from Scotland to England to the U.S. to India, is there, is there a team or is there a kind of unit or a group, maybe aside from the every group, that there was a phenomenal culture that fitted well for you and or Sandy that you look back and you're like, we nailed it there? I, I, th- I think I think we'll mention that. I think, see that, that, that Burnley group we had? Yeah. They were, you know, you mentioned about the, you know, you looked at other squads. And we'd, that, that year, we were, I think with the, we were in the bottom three from the budget. And yeah. we promoted our budget of just over £6 million. Pounds. Yeah. From the championship, to, because the players were they weren't highly paid for being in the championship compared to some of those other clubs. But when you had them all together, I mean that group there, and we had good young players, but also terrific experienced players. Big Stevie Caldwell, who actually went to play at Toronto, my big skipper. Yeah. Mark Kalil yeah. was it was it was a centre back. Graham Alexander, the yeah. Graham Alexander was a consummate professional, and we moved Graham Alexander from being full back because he was getting a bit older, but. He could sense the injury. He was the best passer of the ball you've ever seen. We all know what it was like with his penalty kick. So we brought him in to be there, just to play in front of the back four. And that allowed, Wade Elliott had been a right winger. We brought him in to play inside because I love midfielders that can take people on and, and make a difference, give you a 3v2, a 4v3, a, 2, a 2v1. And Wade Elliott could do that. And the other one we had who played in America as well, he won the MLS actually in Atlanta, was Chris McCann. Chris McCann was my left, my left side midfielder. So those two were allowed to go and do what they do. And anything that came out, Graham Alexander was there, guys was there just to pick up and keep, you know, keep the pressure on, keep the pass, and keep everything going. We had Chris Eagles, Robbie Blake, Martin Parson, Big Tomo. Uh, some of the players we had in that Burnley team for that, that the team that, that took us up, that promotion team, it was incredible. But and I think, I think, I think if you mentioned Graham Alexander, I think that reinvigorated his career on. You know, I distinctly remember you moving him inside and, and he kind of reinvigorated his career or just sitting in front of the back four. Well, we only played for Scotland again then as well at that yeah. time. And listen, I, I can't speak highly enough about him. Not only as a footballer, but as a man. He's doing very well, as you know, in his own uh, coaching yeah. career. Yeah, doing terrific at, at Salford now as well. And he's had success already, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and it's nice when you've had players that have played for you and then go on into the coaching. You know, yeah. Michael, Michael Duff, who then went on and played outstanding at Burnley in the Premier League for many years with, with, with Sean. Michael's doing great at Cheltenham. We partner as, as it says at Miami. So when you see all those boys, you know, then moving in here, it's Bill Wade Elliott's taking under 23 at Stoke. So it's Brian Jensen's goalkeeper coach at a different club. So that group, they, they love, 
this is the thing I love, Eric. I never understood why when somebody came into a football club in the morning, and I understand we all have different, you know, uh, personalities and trials and tribulations in life, but to come into football, for me, that should be a release from everything. You should be bouncing in those doors to, to think you're training at football and that's your livelihood. And go back to your early point, I remember Ian McCall, who I was his player coach, and he said to me one day, he says, Coyley, you're going to have to understand something. And I said, what's that? He says, not everybody's as enthusiastic about football as you. I said, what? He says, when you're, when you're your own man, when you're your, your own manager head coach, you're going in there. And I said, well, I can't get my head around that. How could you not be enthusiastic in this game? It's the best game in the world. Yeah. And, uh, but there we go. I mean, I, I just, as you say, we love the game. You and I always shared that for being young men. And I don't yeah. think that will ever change. And, and just as you mentioned, Ian, Paul, Ian McCall, I remember hearing a story, I think it was Kenny Brannigan. You used to have a lunch club. And, and there was seven, eight, seven or eight of you used to meet for kind of yeah, lunch, to, late breakfast, we, lunch. Used to meet, we used to meet Jack and Ellie's in Partick. That's it, right. You know where I'm going with this story. And, and this is one of my favourite stories. And I remember you told me this, and you used to always leave this little piece of food on the edge of your plate. <laughs> I'll let you finish it now. Because so, so, that was one of your favourite Ian McCall stories. That was brilliant. And, and Collie, I mean, he was such a talented player, Ian. But, I, I mean, I was really lucky because I was always naturally thin. So... Yeah. I had a high metabolism, so whatever I ate, I could just burn it off like that, and I was I was back to what I was. Yeah. But Colin was it? Colin was one of the ones that kind of struggled with his weight. You know, if if he if he wasn't training twice a day, he could put some ounces on. A bit like me, John Robertson, you think yeah. like that. Just just the way that they were made. So and Jack and Ellie's way, and it was kind of horseshoe. So yeah. I would sit, Ian McCall would sit there, and I would sit the opposite. End. Kenny Brown was there, Sandy was there, Gordon Chisholm was there, uh, Fraser Wishart was there, Big yeah. KB. So there was always Brown Rice. It was seven or eight, and it was a Friday, the day before the game on the Saturday. And we used to go, we'd sit there for, for two hours. Anyway, I used to order the, it was called the Big Breakfast. Yeah. So it was the old, a couple of uh, lawn sausages, a, a, a egg, five. Uh, Potato scones must have been in there. Scone, yeah, everything, you name it. So anyway, I, and I could eat it. So I used to eat it, and then at the very end, I'd just leave one of these square sausages. Right, every, and every week, and I'd just leave it. I was sitting opposite Ian McCall, who'd ordered like two tuna, two tuna sandwiches or something. And he was eating them, but he knew he wasn't enjoying them. He was desperate for a big breakfast. So anyway, and we'd finish with the chat away, and, and I'd leave it there. And he says, ah, Connolly. He says, what is it? He says, are you going to eat that? I says, no, I'm full up, Gaffer, I'm full up. Oh, you're just doing that annoying me. I said, I'm not doing that annoying you. He says, hey, you've all got willpower. You don't need to touch that. You're, you're on that health kit. You keep doing what you're doing, no worries. And get back to you talking about something else. So anyway, I just leave it sitting. Next minute, you see what his knife in front of could just have a wee corner. That's what you say, a wee corner. So he cut a wee edge, he's gone to the judge. Within 30 seconds, the whole thing was gone. So then, and the funny thing was, he used to turn around and he used to say, do you know what? See everybody in football, I think you're a nice guy, and you're this and that. You're, you, you're a bad guy. <laughs> because if I made him eat the sausage. <laughs> but I do remember as well, everybody else was in on it. Of course, the boys Everybody else was in on it. And it I became to, a setup. I used to say to them every week, watch this, I'll just leave something at the end. Like, you're going, he's got, and it didn't matter what I left, I'll just a wee edge, a wee, that's right, a wee edge, a wee corner. Collie was brilliant. Please. Oh, that is fantastic, Owen. And just, you know, moving on, you think back to the leaders that played for you, thinking back to the, the captains that you either played for, Owen, or the captains that played for you. Is there, you know, is there anyone that, that kind of stands out that you played for, or, you know, played for you, the captains, the leaders of the teams? I mean, I was say, uh, I think, and you'll know this because of the kind of era we grew up in. Although when we played, you had captains. There was five or six captains. Yeah. Because at that time, I think players were far more vocal, took yeah. far more responsibility and accountability. So yeah. within, if I think back the that every team, you know, and uh, Jimmy Sanders was the captain. Jimmy wasn't the most vocal, but Alan McDonald brought him from, 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 from Hearts and he would say his piece, but you'd still loud people, you know, some, yeah. some real, real characters in that, uh, in that uh, every team, and Winnie Bolton. Phil Brown, Brown was it? Phil Brown was the captain, great captain, leader, made sure he was, you know, there for the players and everything else. But we also had, like John McGinley, Alan Stubbs, Jason McAteer, Alan Thompson, you know, real David Boy, David Lee played, Mark Parson had been the captain at Blackburn. So we'd some some terrific, you know, characters and, and real winners, is and, and you know, you know, proper. You want to say it could be like eleven captains out there. So I think, but I think it's an important part. I think it's an important role. Uh, you know, when. And I always felt, you know, I mentioned Stevie Colwell was my captain at, uh, at Burnley, and, and he was outstanding. I had Kevin Davis at, at Bolton, 
you know, real people that, that stood up and terrific players, but also leader of men, which is really important. And uh, because Kevin, Kevin Davis, Kevin Davis was a striker, which was not your typical, you know, captain role, but he did a phenomenal job for you. Absolutely, and also I inherited Kevin. He'd already been there; he was already the captain. But there was nothing to change because he, he, you know, people might think, well, he wasn't the most vocal, but he led by example. He, he would run until he dropped. He was a great leader. And the other thing with the, with the, the captain's important because if there's something that players in the captain could always come and say, "Oh, go for this or that," or you could go to the captain to, to send them out. So I think I think it's I think it's a very very important role. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Uh, if I think back to you know the Motherwell team I played in, I played up front with, with Tommy Coyne, but with big Brian Martin at the back, uh, Mitchell Van Der Gaard, Billy Davis played in the midfield. With some some outstanding players and, and real characters. So yeah, no, I think uh, that that captain part is a is a is a very important role. It's, it's such a key part, and I think you know just to look at that journey you've been on, Owen, and, and do you look back with any regrets, or do you look back with just pride and and the you know the forks and the road that you took? Do you have any regrets at all, or? No, I, th- I think ultimately it, it, as a player, I just wanted to play, and yeah. there's three or four times. I mentioned uh, Bolton earlier. I was in the Premier League. Uh, yeah. uh, the Premier League got promoted. I scored the playoff final. I said, "This is this." When we talk about you know, learning and stuff, you learn and learning about yourself. So that year at Bolton, we were we were in the the, the League Cup final. I think it was a Cola, Cola, Cola Cup final at the time. Yeah. And we were playing Liverpool. We were a Championship team, but we were also trying to go for promotion. Yeah. And uh, and I'd played ev- I played every round of the cup competition. Yeah. And. Uh, the week before, we uh, we went to play Portsmouth at Portsmouth in a league game, and I was playing up front with uh, with Mixu Mixu Patalain. John yeah. McGinley John McGinley was away in Scotland due to Scotland were playing, and he was missing the game. And on the Friday, we signed Gundy Bergson, who went on to be a Bolton legend from Tottenham Hotspur, outstanding player and an even an even better man, outstanding man. So Gundy was number twelve, and he would play at Portsmouth again, beat one 0 at half time. And I'd actually played well in the first half, or so I felt. I was number 11, I was on that day. Yeah. So I came in at half time, and Bruce Rear, absolutely, I swear, left me without a name, wiped, wiped the floor with me. Yeah. So he finished, I just bit my tongue, I never says anything. I bit my tongue, I never says anything. And then when he'd finished, Gundy Bergson, he tapped me and he says, Oh, and I don't understand. You have been our best player. I says, I know Gundy, I says, but I know what's going on. He says, What? I says, Well, next week's the cup final. He's going to play John McGinley and Mixu part of line with the strikers. So if he hammers me today, it's easy to say, oh, you're on the bench. So anyway, we get to the second half, and if I can play any better, I did. My stay, uh, I beat two or three men, squared one for somebody to tap in, game finished one each, yeah. good result, Portsmouth away. Anyway, coming at full time, same thing, hammered me, wiped the floor with me. So, kind of read the script. So on the Monday, we come into training, they say, oh, I'm going to announce the start in the London. So he announced his strikers, John McGinley makes you part of line. So coming. I'd read it. So anyway, he said, I'll name the subs later in the week. Now at that time, you only had two outfield subs and a substitute goalkeeper. Yeah. So we knew the substitute goalkeeper, Big Aidan Davidson, who went on to play for Northern Ireland and uh, was Phil Brown's assistant at different places. Worked in the US as well, Big Aidan. Uh, so uh, anyway, the, the final was on the, on the Sunday. On the Saturday, Bruce Reeves not at training. Colin Todd's taking training. So Colin Todd finishes training. And someone says, where's the gaff on? He says, oh, he's been down to his house at Luton. He's going to meet us in the hotel tonight. Anyway, we have to name the subs. So we're thinking, well, okay, it'll be in Davidson, uh, Mark Patterson, I mentioned him earlier, he'd yeah. been the, the club captain at Bolton as well. So it'll be him, plus obviously myself as a striker. So he says, uh, subs, uh, in Davidson, uh, Mark Patterson, and uh, Gundy Bergson. Now, Gundy hadn't even come on at, at, Port, at Portsmouth, hadn't even played a minute for the club. No. And I said to Colin Todd, excuse me? They went, whoa, whoa, don't shoot the messenger, because they knew I was quite volatile. Yeah. I said, don't shoot the messenger. I said, I would speak to another man, but he's not even getting, he's not even here. Yeah. He's not even the box, sorry for, yeah. to see yeah. me face to face. So I was blazing, I've got to say, Alex, so I'm in a dress room and my head's spinning. I thought, do you know what? I'm not even going to go on. So I've come in. So McGinley, John McGinley's a good pal of mine. John's come in after. He says, you all right, Colin? I said, no, John. That's a disgrace. He's not even getting the decency to tell me my face. Yeah. I said, oh, no, do you know what? I'm not even, I'm thinking myself, right, I'm not even going. I mean, don't be half so I went in. Uh, you were used to the big communal bar set so I'm in the bath, I'm in there myself, head spin. Anyway, I came out the bath and John says, You're right? He says, Yeah. So, what are you doing? I says, No, I'm going to go. Do you know what? The boys never picked the team. So, we'd, we'd get new suits, shirts, ties a lot, put on Alan, put a smile on my face for the boys. But inside, I've got to say, I was, I was chumming. So, I went down to the final, 
Saturday I support the boys. We lost 2-1. Steve McManaman was unplayable. He was he scored both goals. Alan Thompson scored a brilliant goal for us. We lost narrowly 2-1. The boys were brilliant in the day. My point is, had I sulked, I felt sorry for myself. I'd have went away and never get back. I kept my head down. Two weeks I walked away. He never put me in the team. I was still missing the next three games. Then he brought me back in because my training, I was training at such a high standard. And when he brought me back in, I played every game up to the playoff final. Yeah. Started the playoff final, scored at Wembley to get promoted to the Premier League. Yeah. And the reason yeah. I mentioned that, had a Saltberg had a negative reaction to that, that day at Wembley and that promotion would never came about. So my point is, even in those difficult moments, you've got to know, you get your head down, you do one or two things, you feel sorry for yourself or you get up in the morning, prepare to do something about it. And that ended up with one of, from my playing days, one of my best days as a, as a player to oh, achieve yeah. that from the disappointment of missing, missing the cup final. And it goes what back a to life it. lesson. What a life yeah. lesson on for well, you to look back and reflect on it as a manager now. Yeah. Well, that was one of the things as well, right? because I always made a conscious decision as a manager that yeah. if I was leaving somebody out of my team who'd been playing, I would always take them aside and yeah. say to them, listen, and it was just a respect issue. Yeah. Because I don't think they gave me the respect I was due in that instance. And Bruce Reel, football knowledge was second to none. I would never, I would never ever say anything negative or bad about him. I don't love my life like that. But yeah. we did see eye to eye on a number of things. As a matter of fact, when he got, when Bruce got the Arsenal job, because he got the Arsenal job in the back of us getting promoted to the Premier yeah. League, then after that playoff final, he got the Arsenal job. And I, I mean, a couple of press guys phoned me off and made all sorts of money to do a negative piece about him. And I yeah. said, I'm going to do that. I said, yeah. I've got huge respect for him in, in, in terms of what he sees about football. We clashed on a couple of things, but I would never ever say anything negative because ultimately he was charged with making that decision. I didn't agree with it. But it didn't mean I was going to go and slaughter him because that was the decision he made at the time. So yeah. I've still seen Bruce from time to time and, and, and there's absolutely no problem with that because I understand from being a manager how you've got to make those decisions. But I always felt if I was ever leaving anybody out, I would tell them face to face just to give them that little bit of respect and allow them kind of just to let them soak it in before I announce the team in front of everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Let's just take you on to where, you're, where you are just now on house. I mean, talk about a, a, a change in lifestyle, you know, going to India and moving outside your comfort zone and, you know, taking on a challenge head on. Um, you know, how did that come about and, and how's that going for you? You know, obviously you've had success. You've, you've just finished the season so, so well. Um, you know, is, is that something that you were just want to try? You wanted to get out of your comfort zone? Did you want to go and have a new challenge? I, I, think, I think I've got to be, I think I'm, Brutally honest with it, it was important, I said this to Sandy, that we felt that you would have an opportunity of winning a game because that's what we love doing in football. Now, yeah. having, we've talked about all the good things that's happened, but equally, having a couple of disappointments, which happens to every coach yeah. all over the world, and those disappointments, as I said, yeah, you feel sorry for yourself and you want to do something about it. Now, there's one or two times I've probably taken jobs to, to help friends for maybe for the wrong reason. So I said to Sandy, you know, after we... Uh, uh, we'd left uh, Ross County, right, yeah. the next one we take, it's going to be when we think we've got a fair chance of winning. You know, you get that winning feeling, enjoy what we're doing. Because the perception of football, as soon as you're back winning again, it's, do you know what, that's that guy who's three years in the Premier League, that's him that took that bubbly team, you know, won a league at four. And, uh, and that's the nature of football. But we had to obviously get back on that winning uh, the road again, whatever you want to call it. So I've been offered uh, a couple of jobs in Indian Super League over the last two or three years and, and never taken them. Yeah. So it came about in December and the team had started, uh, well, they started poorly. They'd taken five points, I think, from six games. They'd, four, they'd scored four goals in six games. They hadn't won away from home in uh, over a year and a half. Uh, and they'd already played four games of the six at home. So there was going to be a backlog of away games. Yeah. But when I looked, they looked as though there's some good players, Eric. And I thought, I think we could put that together and you'll get it. Because we like to play an attacking brand of football. Yeah. So that was the first thing I looked at, right? I know they're not scoring goals, but can they score goals? Is there enough players? That we... So when we looked at it, I thought, yeah, if you got them feeling confident and everything else and got them going, then I think we could start winning some games. So I said to you, and this is, a, this is a true story. I love this one. You talk about relationships with Sandy. I've got two grandchildren, but Sandy didn't have any until December. And, uh, and I phoned them up, and uh, the little uh, Emma's daughter had uh, a little baby girl, Orla. So I'd phoned them up to congratulate them. And I said, Sandy, congratulations. He says, oh, thanks, Tony. I said, listen, you have your own kids, you think it's brilliant. When you become a grandparent, I can't tell you. It's, it's, it's a different level. It's amazing. 
I said, so congratulations and all that and everything goes with it. They laughs at all that. I says, thanks, Sony, that's brilliant. I says, hey, do you fancy coming to India? <laughs> so, he, so he said, what? I said, well, we're off the, we've been offered the job in India with Shenna and it looks. I says, at the moment, the season's only got three months to go. I said, so, uh, I said, but I've got to ask you because, you know, I, I, I'll take you anywhere with me, you know that. He says, well, you're going to have to take a couple of days to think about it, speak to Cam. I said, take a couple of days. So anyway, then he came back. I said, no, no, why? Yeah, if you're excited about it, yeah, let's go and do it. So we went in and, and you're right. I mean, the, we, we drew our first game, a tough game away at Jump Shed for one of the next home game. Then we lost two games against the, the league leaders, FC Go, and then an away game where they hadn't won away from home, as I said, in a year and a half. But from then on, you know, even the first two games, there was a lot of positive signs. But so much so, we went unbeaten. We got, because it's a playoff system, so we went from bottom of the league to making the top four for the playoffs. We beat the team in one number one position over the two legs, beat them 4 mil, eh, four one in the first leg. And uh, and then in the final, though, we're disappointed, we, we lost the final. But that being said, it ended up behind closed doors because of the, uh, the coronavirus. So it was a bit surreal. And uh, we actually, you know, we, we, we should probably two up the first five minutes. That being said, uh, we loved every minute of it. We had some very good players. You're allowed to sign seven foreigners. Uh, five can take the field at any given time. So with two Brazilians, with a couple of Romanian boys, with uh, some really, really good players, and with the young Indian players, and that was the other thing, you know, similar, I think, to the young American kids, they're prepared to listen, they're prepared to learn, and when you've got that, that kind of kid to work with, there's a great chance of success. Yeah. When you don't is when the ones that think they know everything, they're not taking anything in, but when kids are attentive and they listen, yeah, okay, and we had that with the young Indian players, and so much so, some of them, the improvement in them, and the improvement in the whole team. So to go from bottom of the league to actually nearly being ultimate champions, it was, we loved every minute of it. And obviously within that, then of course people enjoy what you're doing. And it wasn't even that, from a team that had scored four goals in six games, we were averaging like two and a half goals a game. I mean, the football we were playing, and you know everybody enjoyed that as well. And of course, we love winning games, but you want to play a style of football that everybody enjoys watching. And I'm sure that's what your, your buzz back, your excitement level back, because you've taken on a project, it was massively outside your comfort zone, it was a massive challenge, and you look at where you've gone to today, you know, and, and I'm sure you, you, you've got your mojo back from that. No, absolutely. absolutely. Listen, we, of course, within any, as we know, within any disappointment in football, of course it, it can hurt, we're only, yeah. and that's naturally it does. Yeah. But as I said, you want to find a route to get back to what you're doing, what you enjoy doing. And you're right, myself and Sandy, we love, we love being on the training ground anyway with players, yeah. you know, having that buzz, that excitement, and everything goes with it. And then when you get into the great games, winning those games, I mean, it's, as we know, it's an unbelievable feeling. But as soon as you've won, you think, right, getting ready for the next one as you do it again, because that's just what we love doing. So of course, yeah, it's great. We've been really fortunate, very blessed, to have had a career in football and obviously you want to maintain and continue that for as long as you can. Oh, that was brilliant, Owen. Well, just to finish up here, Owen, that was a, you know, you think of that wee nine and a half stone guy for the Garbles and, and think of where you are today. And I remember those days as your, you know, your sweeper performances at Boghead and, and it's just been a pleasure watching your journey and, you know, being so connected to it and, and just can't thank you enough for joining us today. It was just brilliant to get an insight and uh, just wish you all the best as you head back to India. No, listen, I've loved it. And you know, listen, you and I, we could sit here for 24 hours and talk about it. All day. All day. That, that was my concern coming on. And well, I was actually going to say to you, because obviously time constraints understand that, but we've probably spoken about 10%. There was, there's no I know. Difference. So all I would say is, hopefully whoever's, you know, it's tuned in and listening, hopefully you've enjoyed it. If you needed any more, mention it, I'd be happy to come on and have a chat with anybody. Oh, because the other thing as well, which I think, and I learned this in my pro license, it's really important as coaches that we share with each other. Yeah. Because nobody's any different, to, well, we've all got different jobs to do, but we're not any different to anybody else. I mean, I'm one of nine, I've got five brothers, three sisters, grew up in the Gorbals, with a bedroom for my mum and dad, one for the boys and one for the girls. So at the end of the day, that never ever leaves you, that grounding. And, and you mentioned as well, talking about coaching as well, Eric, because when I was manager, obviously, as you know, uh, when Fabrice Moamba, when Fabrice collapsed. Oh, like, please. I still players. remember that day like yesterday, Owen. Yeah, and, and people say, well, you know, how do you cope with that? You know, no coaching course prepares you for that. Yeah. What that is, you kind of go on how you've been brought up, what your morals are, what your standards, what your principles, how your parents brought you up and everything else to deal with something like that. And the recovery that Fabrice made, I mean, it was, it, it was nothing short of a miracle, and I, I don't mind using that because it was, I mean, 
his heart stopped for 78 minutes. And yeah. you know, normally when that happens, a significant brain damage. You've seen Fabrice now. Fabrice is he's, he's such a clever, clever lad, very well educated, speaks fantastic orally, fit as a fiddle. And they, so it was amazing. But so the stuff like that, and, and that's why his coaches, I think, if you get a chance to sit with other coaches, you just love chatting about the game and sharing stories. And if we can help each other, then that's what we should be looking to do. So I told a few people about who was on. We shared the, the 11 people on. And, and the initial feedback from a lot of your friends, they said, good luck keeping Owen Coyle to one hour. You know, and, and that was the general vibe. That was the general vibe. And, and it was, you know, and, and I totally expected that. And we could sit here for another four hours. And, and you know, it's, this is just an absolute pleasure. You know, and can't thank you enough for your time, Owen. And I just hope that you and your family and, and the kids and grandkids all stay well. But thanks so much for giving us an insight to your world, Owen. Nah, I love that. Can I, hopefully, I'll see you, hopefully I'll see you soon. Thanks again, mate. All the best. All the best, best Take care. Take care, pal. Cheers.